Yeah, so I think we are live. <laughs> How are you? I'm doing well. It's been an interesting day. I it's can... almost like the theme of today has been put into practice. Let's put it that yeah. way. <laughs> interesting. But let me introduce you to the audience. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Interiors. My guest today is Dr. Zachary Green. And let me give you a brief introduction to this very complex and brilliant man. I'm going to read actually my intro of him. Dr. Green is a professor of practice and leadership studies at the University of San Diego, nonprofit institute, as well as lead faculty for RISE Urban Leadership Fellows Program. Additionally, he's co founder and director of Group Relations International. Dr. Green has three decades of experience studying, coaching, and consulting to unconscious systemic dynamics of global organizations. His international clients include the World Bank and Imago Global Grassroots. That's in India, isn't it? Is that in India? Well, primarily we work in India, but we also oh. work in South America too, yes. Got it. Mm -hmm. um, early, in his, early in the pandemic, he co-authored an article entitled Mapping the Developmental Stages of Contagion Response, as well as a series of companion essays, which include Zoom and, Doom and Gloom, Zoom right. and gloom, the rise of video conferencing, onset depression, and deaf and dumb, overcoming emotional coma. Dr. Green earned his doctoral, his doctorate in clinical psychology from Boston University and completed advanced training at Cambridge Hospital, Harvard Medical School, Georgetown University, and the Wharton Center for Applied Research. Dr. Green, thanks for being with us today. Thank you, Alexis. I really appreciate yeah. it. Yeah. So one of the things we talked about um, in respect to your coming on was exactly what are we going to talk about? And I was really surprised and, um, yeah, I think surprised that we, that you, that we kind of decided to talk about racial equity and common humanity, but not talk about them in terms of polarities, yeah. but talk about them in respect to the tension between those two those two constructs. And oftentimes when we think of tension, particularly in this time of pandemic, we run from tension. I mean, we're overloaded by the tension of uncertainty. And yet when you talked about the tension between racial equity and common humanity, I became really fascinated by that. Can you tell me why that's an important subject to talk about? Absolutely. The, the reason that this is so important to me, Alexis, is because I believe it is in the tension that that's where the learning is going to happen or is happening. There's a way that there are, there are elements to this in terms of racial equity, where the, the notion of structural inequality, structural racism, uh, systemic racism, however you want to put that, that isn't something that I think is really subject to debate in the same kind of way. I mean, that, th there's an abundance of evidence to point to those realities. Uh, it's a question of can you enter the next conversation alongside that, where that can be held in consciousness on one hand, while we also attend to the elements of where uh, our relatedness to one another intersects. And that's where the challenge is, because there are elements in terms of our common humanity that we also have as a part of this conversation, but we're not able to, to enjoin that in the same kind of way would be how I start off saying that. Yeah, you know, as you were saying that, I, what came to me was the, the, the new language we use around things like that. And so now one of, the, one of the language, one of the kind of linguistic presentations we give to this is I'm gonna hold your, I'm, I'm holding space. Mm -hmm. Right. We use that. We use that language. And so as you talk about that is what you're inviting people to do is to hold the space of those polarities and still hold the space of the tension between them. What does it take to do that? What does it take? Because I have a certain identity. I mean, I, mm -hmm. I, I want us all to, I mean, I can talk to our common humanity. Right. But also at the same time, you're asking me to hold a tension that may create a dissonance within me. Well, I think that that's the primary issue, is the dissonance. You see, when I hold any aspect of my identity as essential as uh, defining of the very character of who I am, 
then that is very important for social, political, historical meaning. So I don't want to negate that. And see, the problem with that is that if I say that that is important, but I want us to attend to the tension, it seems and is heard in terms of the narratives that we carry around as if that part is being dismissed. No, I'm saying, hold that, hold that. Okay, now we've got that. Now, what is this space? The space between is then something else that is going on where I'm learning about you. I'm listening fully, completely, uh, without uh, expectation or attachment to the narrative that you are bringing also around your experience, which is going to be inconsistent with some core element of how I understand myself. Now, what then allows that to go to a next level, and I do mean level, I do mean this in something of a hierarchy, and I'll get to that later. Then what happens is then we are able to hold the other as not other, but as an expression or a reflection of ourselves. There is so much investment right now into the projection onto the other and so much investment in the narrative that I know that we then defend against any kind of new information that comes in that's disconfirming of the, the space and place that we do hold. That's, that's the real tension in this. Yeah, you, you're inviting me to psychologically die. I'm just going to say that. And I don't just like that. that. <laughs> but I, I can understand where you are. Come on, Alex. Are you serious? You really mean that? <laughs> well, let me reframe that. You're oh, no, no. Let's, no. Let's go with the way that you talk okay. about it. I don't think it's far off. Yeah, I, you're inviting me to psychologically die because when you ask me to listen to you in such a way that I am listening to you without expectations, what you're asking me to do is to do what you defined as my identity prior to saying that, and that is my historical, emotional, psychological, cultural identification and identities right. that, I, that I suggest or I have owned as the definition of me. And so now I have to listen to you uh, and listen to your story by shedding all of that. So where does that leave me? Where does that leave me? Okay, wait a minute. First of all, I didn't say without expectation. I said without attachment. Okay, there's, there's, that's a subtlety. But it's an important subtlety uh, because the attachment means that I can not have an investment in a particular outcome of what you say. And so you are allowed to hold all of the pieces of you that you want to present. I'm not in any way trying to negate that. Mm -hmm. okay, so, so, so can you hear me in that? So I'm not asking that to die. So, so the, the, the reason I bristled <laughs> is because you're saying, uh, I'm killing you off psychologically. Uh, it's hardly the case. It's, 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 I want you to hold the richness of that psychological resonance. Hold that, okay? Yeah. Uh, let me learn about that with you. And so let, let's do it a different way. How often in any of the current conversations that we are having around race, are we able to listen fully through a person's experience? That's what I'm asking. Yeah. And, I, and, I, and I'm asking that of myself. I, I know that when I uh, make primary my racial identity, then I am less apt to be able to hear anything about whiteness that is disconfirming of how I understand that in terms of blackness. Okay, and so, so therefore it's a block, you know, and so, so my investment there is in the duality. I have a deep investment in the duality because whew, then I'm sort of safe over here knowing at least what I am in terms of blackness, you know, in that, in that sort of duality. Now, when I make it much more nuanced, when the boundary becomes more permeable, then I run into issues because then I have to recognize that whiteness isn't over there as some kind of construct. Whiteness is also over here in terms of my own experience, in terms of the parts that I've inculcated into my being. Uh, and so therefore, if I only keep it projected outside, then I feel safer. That, that, that's, that, that's the safety I think all of us ultimately want because, um, let's see, I'm almost about to agree with you uh, because it feels <laughs> as if there's a part of me that has to be killed off, left aside, um, 
at least uh, held in abeyance yeah. in order to get to a different place. Oh, you're all happy with yourself. <laughs> I'm very happy. <laughs> no, I love when you come to my side. <laughs> yeah, I know you do. Yes. <laughs> Well, but I think that's the nature of the discourse is that then I, I really needed to do that even here and with you. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I, I, Amanda is telling us we're both naked now. Now we're both psychologically naked. Um, I, I think I, I love that. I, I love that. Um, I love that um, perception of owning the internal aspect of whiteness and blackness. Yes. Right. Um, because when I project it out and it's out there, then it becomes the other, right? It's something outside of me and I can objectify it, right? Mm -hmm. And I can objectify it based on my experiences, either good or bad, right? And that could be moment to moment. I can have an experience with whiteness, to use that language, that really informs me that, hey, this is kind of cool. The, the, the whiteness is not as bad as I thought it was. And then another half an hour, I run into someone else and the whiteness, to use that term, presents in a very painful kind of way, I go. Wait a minute! I change my mind, so I become, I become. Um, I what is the word? I give up my power based on kind of this external presentation of whiteness. Versus, if I sit within my whiteness and know that my blackness and my whiteness resides within me, then I can actually listen to you. But how do, given the polarization of this society at this time? How does one own their internal whiteness? And how does one own their internal blackness? How do I sit in that? Okay. Uh, let, me, let me enter from a different perspective because that presents it as a duality in terms of construction. Mm -hmm. I want to, can I broaden that a little bit? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so yeah. I think it has to be broadened to the, the notion of the construction in the first place. Okay. Uh, that each of us, in terms of whatever core identity we choose to work with, uh, have investment and have learned about and have uh, some experience of those things being socially reinforced. So I'm socially reinforced around a construct that is called blackness. And there are certain things that go along with that. And so I, I live into that. And then there are other people who share sort of certain cultural uh, experiences and characteristics and historical elements that all come together and then we define this. And then we know the edges of the boundary of that. Uh, but that by definition is in the presence of something that is other and that other in this basic level is called whiteness. And whiteness is its own construction. Uh, and it has all of these elements. And there is this dance of these two constructions. Okay, that's the first part. Now, uh, the dance of the constructions really require a, a sort of a space of relatedness. And that's where the tension is. So the fact that uh, the, the nature of how I'm speaking, the language that I'm using could be already interpreted in some spheres as the introjection of all kinds of whiteness because of the universities I've attended, um, the, the social uh, organizations I'm a part of, the professional organizations that I have um, been a part of as well. So all of that could be construed as uh, uh, whiteness, but in terms of phenotype, in terms of history, I can point to a thing called blackness. So what do we do with that? And what does anyone do with that? And that's the part of the conversation that gets lost. That's the part of the conversation where I cannot frankly speak to the relatedness with whiteness that has been taken in that may even be a source of joy, pleasure, excitement, because at this particular historical moment, that's supposed to be extruded. Okay, and so I am supposed to, on some level, there's a cultural injunction to focus on that which is Black, Black Lives Matter. And from a political and social perspective, I get that. Now, how do we get to the other part? How do we get to, therefore, the learning in it that is a part of it? So when we, we talk, for example, about white fragility, okay, white fragility is a wonderful way that D'Angelo has presented to white people to understand their experience when they're talking about race. That has been at the cost of then reducing a sense of agency 
in terms of black folks, in terms of their own experience. Now, it has done service on one hand, but on another hand, it also is a source of denigration. Okay, same thing with Peggy McIntosh's work. Brilliant work that allows for us to understand privilege as a construct and for white people to sort of own the unearned assets they have. And then by me saying that I have white privilege, then is acknowledging the supremacist notions of it at the same time. Can we talk about that? So, so the availability of those elements of the conversation, not available, not available at all. That's what I'm trying to get to. Yeah, and so I would say to you, Zach, I really love that. And I see the magic in that. I see the magic in that. And yet, um, if, if I, if I hold the whiteness in me, um, is that hierarchy? Do do I then have to degrade the blackness in me? Or if I hold the the whiteness? The hegemonic argument doesn't. Yeah. Yeah. I'm present, I'm present. You, you froze for me for a second. Yeah. I I, yeah, but you froze. You froze at the exact moment that I needed you to freeze because I didn't want to hear any of that. <laughs> because well, yeah, this is so that's that's the, the 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 easy negation. The easy negation is to talk about hierarchy and uh, hegemony. Okay, that is the easy and supremacy. Right. Yes. Okay. From a social so again, our premise from a social historical perspective for at least the last four hundred years. You know, 1619, yes, okay, yes, true. That's not the argument. And some would say that that argument needs to be held long enough until the actual uh, reparations around that have been met, agreed. But I think part of the reparations being met require a sufficient number of people to be able to acknowledge the mutuality of this construction, okay? Uh, which has hierarchy in it, which means that there has been a supremacist uh, from a whiteness perspective that has denigrated blackness. Yes, those things are actually true. That is not negated. But what I'm also talking about that, that if in my blackness I only hold that, then I also support the perpetuation of those labelings and the delimiting nature of the, that labeling as well, without really looking at the longer historical sweep. <sighs> okay, get, oh, you got me started. Okay, so uh, the, the way that it used to be, like Cicero wrote uh, a long time ago, take not your slaves from Britain, for they are white of skin and dull of wit. Okay, so if we go back 2,000 plus years, then we have a reversal of the same dynamic. OK, so so therefore, it's according to what your unit of analysis is, your way of understanding of this. And all of that has to be va- available. And the, the the willingness or the desire to sit in that complexity is what I would invite some people to do, at least a critical mass of people to do. Yeah. And so when you talk about that, when you talk about the willingness to sit in complexity, oftentimes in a society that requires and oftentimes are in love with and addicted to a happy ending, right? We have a conversation and it's tied up in a nice pretty bow. Sitting in complexity may invite, in fact, may disinvite a nice pretty answer with a bow on the package. It may create actually further complexity, right? Than actually giving me relief. And so when you invite me to sit in complexity, what is in a society that has a very short attention span, (laughs) right? Um, How do we find spaces to really understand that you and I will engage in a conversation that may not have an immediate answer? But the fact that we dare to engage in this complex conversation has value and benefit. Is there space and a way to do that? And are there models in society where that's occurring. Right, yeah, the, the, the right now the attachment is right, wrong, yes, no, black, white, as okay. opposed to learning, mutuality, curiosity. So <laughs> if we change the, the discourse in terms of what is the outcome. So if my outcome is about curiosity about who, who are you? I mean, I, you mean you look black? Are you talking with this British accent? I mean, who are you? Okay, okay. You're talking about me carrying around whiteness. What is that? And so, therefore, 
Okay. Yeah. Okay. You you wanted to go there, right? Okay. So so therefore therefore there's a curiosity about that representation. Okay. Of you. And how does that come in? Because it's inconsistent. I remember the first time I heard uh, a, a black person speaking with a British accent that was uh, 14 years old working at a corner pharmacy as a cash register person. And this person, yes, might I, might I have a cigarette? And they didn't call it a cigarette. They used other words. And I just kept staring because I didn't know how to take that in because it was inconsistent with my understanding. Yeah. Now, the curiosity, though, the curiosity invites a deeper inquiry. And through that inquiry, mm -hmm. then we begin to learn. And through that learning, then we're each opening the boundary of the possibility of what another person of a certain construction might hold and contain and be. I love that. I want to put. Are music. you frozen? No, no. Can you, can you see me? Am I still frozen? No, no, no. You're unfrozen now. Okay. I said I wanted to put music to that. That was quite lovely. Did you hear me? Or am I still frozen? Uh, yeah, I heard you. No, I heard you. I heard you. Yeah, I, I, so, I had difficulty taking that in, but thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I, I think when you talk about curiosity, I mm -hmm. think one of the things that happens with curiosity is that. Um, we have become slave to the 30-second commercial, okay. the 30-second soundbite. Mm -hmm. And so to live in curiosity is certainly, uh, I don't think there's any other way to live in a world that we don't know, we don't understand, we don't really know where we come from, we don't know where we're going, we don't know why we're here, right? If we were to share all the external um, man-made complexities we've used, to distract us from the wonder of life, right? This is the birth of curiosity. So curiosity is this piece of music that's constantly playing in the backgrounds of our, of our collective lives. And yet, for some reason, as a species, we want solid, firm answers of certainty in a universe and in a construct that is anything other than certain, right? Mm -hmm. um, so when you ask me to live in curiosity about you, as a black person, or me as a black person with a British accent, um, there is something that I want the shorthand for. I don't want the intellectual lifting that's required to get to know you because I don't have time for that. I, 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 I you know, I, I want this kind of monolithic shorthand in which to engage you so that I can understand you and move on to something else. Yes. And so in a society where time is this commodity that we never have enough of, the invitation to sit in this complexity of race, which has economic impact, which has social impact, which has psychological impact. We won't talk about depression. We won't talk about all the things that comes with that. Um, what is the role of time and empathy okay, thank you. in this kind of invitation to kind of do this? Gosh, the, 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 you... you um opened up about 15 layers at the same time. Let me speak more immediately. Uh, is, uh, there is a, there, there's a problem of temporality, you know, it's because temporality, which we've spoken about on other occasions, means that one thing comes before another, okay? So, so uh, what I want, and I think we all want, is that sort of Malcolm Gladwell blink of recognition, you know, so that we can just make this sort of quick assumption and then we can go on about our lives. And, and you know, and there's all kinds of neurological evidence that that's indeed what we do. You know, we go back to the limbic system and then we do something with the neocortex to, ah, oh, good, we can, indeed, we can deal with that. So there, there's that element of it. Yes, we do. So I'm going, you know, we, we don't disagree on that part. But what I think has happened up until this point, and let's use race as a focal moment. So what then has allowed some of the challenges before to, to be okay is that when a white officer shoots a black man using a bullet, pulling a trigger, when it's a split second decision, there can be all kinds of sort of understanding of the nature of that because of feeling threatened. And we can go into all the social historical reversal of projection that that is about. Okay. 
But then when you go to George Floyd's murder, then what made that different is that wasn't that split second trigger, but you have eight minutes and 46 seconds where we are focused because we're not distracted by all those things that you described. And so therefore it makes it come alive and real in a way that we can then see ourselves as George Floyd and then I would imagine a lot of us could also see ourselves as the officer with the knee to the neck, you know, and then it evokes the social historical picture of, of lynching and then the white crowds that used to, you know, do this and celebrate that. And then it enjoins the Jim Crow era and then in, 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 in it evokes the sort of notions of enslavement. And so all of that sweep then comes into that eight minutes and 46 seconds. But what you described is another kind of temporality in that split second one. We've sort of given ourselves permission to allow that. There's all kinds of work done on, on implicit bias and microaggression that sort of tries to lift that up. But our behaviors are really ingrained at a much deeper level where that eight minutes and 46 seconds is actually what's underneath all of this. And that's what the challenge is of this is because of the amount that gets evoked in just one part of my identity, just the black part of my identity in this particular moment, in this particular moment, is what I have to deal with and I have to face. And I can go into more around temporality, but, you know, that's just enough for now. Well, no, you know, kind of interesting. I'm feeling a sense of a mutual prison, mutual imprisonment. Okay, say more about that. Um, the whole idea of if you, if I see me as, um, if my identity is exclusively or primary, primarily as a black person, right? I kind of limit my ability to express myself, right? Because I'm, I am more than that. I'm that, but I'm more than that. Mm -hmm. And if you see me, not you, but if another sees me solely as black, they are imprisoned in that monolithic narrow confine. And so their engagement with me and me with them becomes this narrow engagement, right? This very imprisoned, yes. limited, myopic universe, right? And so a black man with a British accent may not fit into your monolithic concept of what a black person is. And so you meet me and so you have to then deconstruct and untangle, right? Your definition of me as black man. And then eventually you may come to, well, you're not really black. There we go. I was about to take your black card away by the question that you were asking in the right. first place. And that is one of the things that we do is this dismissing and counseling of the other uh, in terms of if you go too far in that direction. And indeed, the way that I'm speaking right now is enough to um, impute that this is not blackness. This is not yeah. really, you know, the, 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 the expression of it. Uh, uh, don't I understand that there is a movement force that's going on that requires absolute focus and attention right now? And then similarly, the question that you're talking about imprisonment, isn't that just an acceptance of and uh, buying into a, a narrative of enslavement in a different language, you know, mass incarceration and the like? And so if we go down that road, then yes, but there's also an aspect of, of, of celebration of culture, uh, of an understanding of what blackness also represents that gets lost even in that kind of question. And so how do we broaden the question beyond imprisonment, but to, to the, the kind of benefit and the sort of qualities that are a part of it? that allow us to stay in the narrative, you know, because there's a beauty and a value in it as well. Uh, but can we talk about that? I don't know. You know, what comes to mind is Sidney Poitier, and guess who's coming to dinner, mm -hmm. you know, and how that movie was an attempt of showing the black man beyond kind of societal's definition of him. He went to Harvard, he taught at Yale, he, I mean, you couldn't have made him any more perfect, right, in order for him to be accepted. And so if you didn't like him, you were just simply a jerk. You weren't a bigot, you weren't a racist. Here's this perfect guy, right? And if you didn't like him, you were just, you weren't a racist, you weren't a bigot. 
And so sometimes this idea of black men having to be perfect in order to be accepted by society or having to speak the king's English or having to be a megastar, right? Or having to be some superhero in order for his blackness not just to not be important, but not to be seen, right? It's almost that sometimes a class invites I'm someone to not see my color because I can go to Paris, I can go to New Zealand, I can do all the things yeah. because I have the economy to do these things. And so somehow my economy and my class somehow hides or disinvites you to see my color. You could just see me as another human being. And so when that happens, when you see me as a human being because you choose not to see my color, what what is the tension there? Am I evading the tension? No, Am I speaking you, into you, it? What, you're, what's, speaking, what's the, you're, speak, you're speaking into it, but you're speaking into it um, in this sort of way where the sort of conciliatory aspect of, of you know just the black male, but also the sort of the, the negation of uh, black women other than being strong black women, the, the sort of denigrated uh, projections along with that. Is, is okay. It's it's narrowing. It's 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 narrowing. So uh, so so the Poitier example then gets to the classic argument, the 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 the, the, the sort of the splitting, if you will, between uh, a Malcolm X and a Martin Luther King. So we cannot hold the revolutionary aspect of what a Martin Luther King. So he sanitized into "I Have a Dream" without even dealing with the economic justice arguments that he was making that we are still seeing the legacy of those problems now. And some would say what was the actual meaning and, uh, and, and reason that his death came about because he was going after capitalism at the end of his life. And so therefore we hold them as a foil against each other. And that, you know, we go back historically in terms of Du Bois and, and, and Booker T. Washington, you know, uh, Booker T. Washington being seen as a great conciliatory and Du Bois really talking about the nature of a kind of a black consciousness. So what we have is that these social historical tensions that exist, uh, and we can see it in other movement forces, uh, especially around intersectionality in terms of black women and liberation and white women and suffrage, and how uh, the two could not be held as one. And so therefore, there were the tensions of that. So we see all of these sort of constructions that then become delimiting and therefore, we're not able to once more hold the complexity. That's where the tension shows up again. One of the things in England, um, when you yeah. ride the tube, um, as you stand on the platform, right. and the tube comes up, there's this wonderful little three words there, right? Which mind the gap. <laughs> <laughs> and, and those three words are sitting with me as you were speaking because... There is that gap there. There is that gap there. And we do as much as we can to not speak about it. So if we were to invite white people, and I'm using that word deliberately, to sit in the tension, in the tension um, between racial equity and common humanity, because that's the theme of what we're talking about, what would be the right questions they would ask themselves. And if we were inviting people of color, black people, I'm using that language deliberately as well, to sit in the gap, in the tension, what is the right question? Because perhaps we're at the point now where we don't need the right answer primarily as much as we need to ask the right questions. And I'm, and I'm thinking, what is the right question to sit in the tension? So I'm not seeking answer. I'm not seeking an answer. I'm doing some inquiry to further eliminate, not eliminate, but to free me, to free me from the myopia, the myopia of my always having to have the right question, I mean, the right answer. We each have an investment in sustaining the conversation and the behaviors as they are now. What would happen if we were to shift that? What if uh, the benefits that are accrued as whites could be really, truly examined? And what would happen from a black, and I mean, these are very crude, limited terms, but nonetheless. 
uh, that there is a way of understanding that uh, my social historical reality still exists, uh, but I want you to see me beyond. It's almost the contents of the character piece, but it's it's more. Um, now, now we're in a space. I, I think that is the actual space of inquiry, Alexis. I think that what is the question that allows us to find a different conversation with each other? Because most of the conversation now is uh, uh, black people saying, please recognize the harm that you have done historically. Uh, please recognize that you've put together a system of interconnected structures that assures uh, a picture of dominance. And, and let's own the consequence that it has from, from birth to death on people with black skin, okay? And then whiteness says, uh, let us sort of recognize that, okay, if that is true, then how do I have the conversation with you now to begin to rectify that without being held in account for things that I did not myself personally create? So this is the conundrum that we're in right now. So it goes back to our beginning conversation. Can we sit in the tension and listen without expectation? Is that, was that the language? Without expectation? Attachment. The, to the story of the other. Mm -hmm. and, and give sufficient time for that story to be told so that perhaps we can both be complicit in the deconstruction of that story. I think we have to live in the deconstruction of the story because uh, I, I think the, the nature of enslavement and oppression as practiced in this nation and enshrined in the Constitution, the reparation around that is bottomless. It is endless. It is infinite in its nature. And then I think any person who owns whiteness then will recognize at the true depth of how much benefit has come from this thing called whiteness uh, and how uh, that they are progeny of that. Uh, and that is also endless and bottomless. And so therefore it doesn't leave us much room for anything that's generative. I sat with a woman, um, Dr. Ellie, I think is her last name. I'll, I'll tell you her name before this is over. She's a Holocaust survivor. And um, she talked about being with her mom when they were in line yeah. to, at Auschwitz. And um, this German soldier randomly came and took her hand as a little child and took her sister's hand and said, your mom will be right back. And she pulls her hand out of this soldier's hand and says, no, I want to go with my mother. And for whatever reason, he reached back and said, um, no, 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 your mom will be right back. And he held her. And she's now about 90 years old, lives in La Jolla, a graduate of Harvard, I've written several books. I'm trying to remember her last name. And I said, are you angry at this guy? And she goes, well, isn't it interesting? The man who sent my mother to the ovens is the same man who saved my life. And I said, but you've got to be angry with him. And she says, you know, I'm angry at him, but I'm not addicted to the anger. Okay. I'm not addicted to the anger. And I said, well, if you saw him, what would you say? She said, you know, I would ask him, who taught you to behave this way? Here we go. Who taught you to behave this way? And I love the, the recognition that I'm angry. <laughs> I'm deeply angry. Mm -hmm. I'm angry in ways that I cannot define. I'm angry in ways that has no definition, no narrative, no, I'm just angry in incomprehensible ways. And yet I'm not addicted to the anger, you know? And I'm wondering if in the polarization, in the tension that you talk about, there's so much anger in there that we're afraid to step into it because perhaps to some degree, we have lived in narratives that have established my identity 
that has led us to become addicted? Are we addicted to anger? Are we addicted to being angry with each other? And again, I think addiction then uh, evokes all kinds of other kind of imagery to it. I think that we have an epigenetic connection to that rage, that okay. it is something that is carried within us, that is a part of us, that we are it. And so it isn't a, so much an addiction as it is the activation of that by experiences that remind us uh, in, as embodied presence as a human being of the indignity of a, one human being to another. That's the part, I think, that gets activated. And so uh, the story you tell is so rich because I think it is emblematic of the challenge in this tension uh, to the degree that, you know, I carry whiteness genetically in me. Uh, do I then hold in, in account the rapist who then created this line of my being. My being is, an, a, is a function of violence. So I carry that violence in me, that violence that was perpetrated towards my family at some level. And I owe my existence in part to it as well. How do I even begin to have that thought? It doesn't negate on any level the responsibility for the harm that is done and the violence that is there. But from a human perspective, uh, our, our, our life, our being, is often shaped by and our very character shaped by these aversive experiences. It's not to welcome them, but it's to learn to live with their meaning and how they express how we how we cope with one another. Mm. Mm. Um, and so what you're inviting me to do yeah. uh, is to, I am fully seated in the tension as we're speaking, right? Nice. Uh, my, gran my grandfather is white Scottish guy, mm -hmm. right? Married my grandmother who is black and Indian. And so in my family makeup, the skin color <laughs> goes from white uh, to my aunt in New York, who is very, very dark skinned, to my mom, who's about your complexion or a little bit lighter. Mm -hmm. And so as you talk about the nuance, you yes. know, the granularity of if I fully examine my life, you know, what would my identity be? Exactly right. That is exactly what I'm saying to you. Exactly yeah. what I'm saying to you, because when I go back three generations, we do not talk about the the white man that impregnated my great grandmother, because we don't talk. I, I do not know to this day what the story is of their relationship. All I know is that that is something that is coursing through me, mm -hmm. you know, and that is a part of me and that I have a part of myself. I speak to my own children who did their genetics tests and found out that they are 54 and 57 percent European. Uh, and then what does it do when the world perceives them as young black men? Yeah. And that they will have to live the historical meaning of that as they walk the streets uh, yeah. and as they encounter police. And so the, the, this is the kind of tension that I'm talking about. Yeah. And each of us holds different elements of that tension as well. Yeah. As we're speaking, I find that... At a cellular level, and this is not to exaggerate it or, mm -hmm. or, or to be traumatic, but I'm feeling something inside of me that is, that is both exhilarating and liberating. And at the same time, I'm like a tingling. And I can't really define the tingling, but it feels right. like I'm sitting in the tension that we've talked about. And then this question came up for me, is how do we become and manifest more of our common humanity. Because what we seem to manifest more of, and perhaps society is to be um, examined for this, for the currency of rage, there seems to be a currency of rage that isn't equal to the cur currency of our collective humanity, right? Um, there's this 
I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I think that that's the default. I think the currency of rage keeps us uh, in that place. I think the currency of love is stronger. Uh, I, I think uh, the, the, there are three ways I want to. I think it was Margaret Mead. I don't know. Someone will correct me on that. Uh, I said, what was the, 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 the sign that we had really emerged from, from our genetic heritage um, uh, in, in terms of evolution? Uh, was it some piece of pottery? Was it some tool? And she said, no, it was a mended bone because that meant that someone had to stay with someone long enough. <laughs> For them to have that bone mended, okay. And George Valen, you know, wrote wrote in the same kind of way that it is the 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 compassion for others that allowed us to travel and to migrate from our common progeny, which you know biblically and genetically seems to be in in, in Africa. So in order to do that, there had to be a sort of a holding and a joining and a being with. But then what began to happen is that we, as we separated uh, geographically, we also separated into these things that became defined as these races, these nations, and all of these artificial constructions. But yet, uh, in terms of procreation, we can all procreate with each other. And my mother's argument is that enslavement may have ended as much because of love, not to deny the violence and all of those pieces, no. But uh, that uh, not all of that was violence. And so the parts that, that, that maybe wasn't violence, we can't enter the conversation because of the oppression narrative that goes along with it. Yeah. And so, so, so those of us that find ourselves in relationship with people who are of different races and cultures are constantly navigating the space. And now I, I have written about this before that, that I believe that there's a third space, which then creates a space of potential. And what I mean by that, you know, you know, really quickly is that when you do a polarity, you have a straight line and this sort of a tension, kind of like a rubber band. But soon if you, pr you know, bring out a third point and you're both looking at that point together, you've created a larger plane of potential and all of that potential has the potential of being named and understood and lived into i'm inviting all of us to live in the tension between the reality of the racial elements of systemic racism and to live into the common humanity all those as a different kind of polarity than to project out and say then what else is there what else is available in the conversation? That is not exclusively an intellectual exercise. That no. requires more than intellect. It requires more than intellect. It is an actual practice. You know, we've been dancing with that a little bit here. Uh, you know, when I speak to you about your accent and, you know, and then also giving you the history of my own experience. But if uh, you are a white interviewer in the sense of like your skin was white, then we would also then talk about that because then, uh, then what begins to happen is then the complexity of the texture of that in terms of the dance of hierarchy that you spoke of later, uh, earlier, is then begins to play out. You know, uh, one of my favorite games is to be in a situation where I have not spoken yet. Uh, and then the presumption would be that I don't have much to say. And if I do have something to say, it will not be of much uh, contribution. Uh, they, they, certainly don't, they certainly don't know you. <laughs> right. And then one of my favorite games is to, okay, I, I, I will be happy to play the smartest man in the room game with you, or person in the room, you know, now that I've been educated on such things. Uh, and so I'm, I love playing that game uh, once I've read the room. Uh, and then then what that does is you can see the narrative flipping on its head and the sort of somersaults of, the, of that that happens in those, um, in those moments. And, and, and so that's a form of violence that I do uh, because I know that I'm sort of in a position where I can play that. Uh, and I love it because of what it creates in terms of discomfort. Mm -hmm. Now, what we have not talked about is the shadow aspects of how all this plays out 
there is a shadow in terms of uh, of the mutuality of uh, contemptuous violence that we do to other humans for the benefit of a momentary sense of of dominance. And I think all of this is ultimately about dominance, irrespective of what we're talking about. We're talking about race right now, but we could also be talking about this in terms of gender, sexual orientation, nationality, economics. Uh, and and uh, I, I really love what Audre Lorde said, uh, is that th these things do not have hierarchy, you know, that they're all interconnected with one another when we ultimately get to that conversation. But can we hold that conversation in consciousness? And I dare say that that's our challenge right now. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, it's kind of interesting as you were speaking, I was thinking about nature and biomimicry. There's a whole school of biomimicry. And there's nothing in nature that operates on the principle of hierarchy. Everything in nature operates on the principle of interconnectedness, mm -hmm. right? And I think there's something about Western thought where um, there is something about being or seeing, well, first of all, we live on the narrative of rugged individualism. I am my own man. I am separate from everyone else. And again, I would submit there's nothing in nature that is modeled on the concept of rugged individualism. There is nothing that in nature that's not interconnected. And I, I would love for someone to send me something that proves otherwise, right? Um, by the way, I just got a text from my fiance who said the book is called The Choice <laughs> and is by Dr. Edie Edgar, E-D-G-A-R. Dr. Edie Edgar, Harvard grad, the woman who was taken away from her mom um, by, the German, um, by the German soldier randomly. Um, I lost my train of thought. <laughs> Sitting in everything was interconnected, but I will also want to say yes, that's that one one part. But there are growth hierarchies in uh, nature, and growth hierarchies are uh, like uh, the movement from the caterpillar to the uh, chrysalis to the butterfly. So there are growth hierarchies. So you know, have the concurrence of the interdependence on one hand and growth hierarchies. But a growth hierarchy is not the same thing as a dominance hierarchy. And what we as humans have created are these dominance hierarchies, uh, which we have an investment in, and that's where the shadow, where, uh, the, you know, Freud talked about the narcissism of small differences, where there's an the investment in the minutest difference so that we then can, you know, denigrate the other. Yeah, and so now we're getting into power and the use of power to yes. transform paradigms, constructs, and systems, right? And then if we talk about power, we have to talk about ego. Right, and the egoic definition of so we, I mean, again, and I think that's the, this both the, I think that's the elegance of sitting in, in complexity. And I wonder if the, the virus has invited us to do this in a way that we probably wouldn't have done it. And, and each of us doing it in our own way. But my language in respect to the virus, um, is that it has, you know, it has killed my external identity. My external self is no longer there to the degree to which I engaged in it and identified with it. So I've actually called the show, Inter the show Interiors because I believe the virus has invited me to sit within my interior for a moment of mindfulness, self-reflection. That is, I can't use a bad word on here, but is so messing with my ego. Because my ego said, hey, I miss this, I miss the restaurants, I miss the lights, I miss the fancy cars, I miss the blah, 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 meeting with Zach and sitting in coffee shops for three, four hours. And right, there's this egoic dance that's happening within me um, that can lead to a depression, that can lead to anxiety, because now I'm sitting within the interior of myself, and I am discovering, perhaps for the first time, dragging, <laughs> the virus is dragging me to be mindful, dragging me to sit in my interior, and my external self simply don't know what to do with this. And then we see the contrast to that as well on three levels. So one, we see the pixelated representations that are being broadcast right now. And so this is not really us, but there's a you know, representation of us. And so there's an interior experience. 
But I also think that's what has driven people to protest. And what George Floyd's murder represented is that even in the face of this virus, they were saying that there's an essential part of my identity that's still being assaulted. And so I really much speak up to that. And then we have the wonderful, contrasting, almost paradoxical experience of Portland, where the predominant number of people doing Black Lives Matter protests are white, standing up against a paramilitary force at this particular moment. Now, just just think about. I'm holding it. I'm holding. I'm I'm dancing with that. Yeah, yeah. just think about what that represents right now. And so this is about trying to move this sort of field of consciousness uh, from a field of consciousness from the sort of the morphogenic space to the physical form, to the actual expression. And so, uh, yes, the interior then invites uh, sort of an external representation and that these power dynamics are playing out right now. And people are risking their lives, both in terms of the virus and then standing up to the hegemonic forces of power uh, in this sort of autocratic moment uh, to really say no to this, no to that. And so that's another expression of the tension uh, in very real time, in a very real way. Um, You've made me extremely comfortable in sitting in the tension. And what I recognize is that in speaking with you for this past 40, 45 minutes is and I just thought of this, is that sitting in the tension isn't fearful. I was bringing my fear mm-hmm. into the tension because now that I'm in here and I'm engaged with you um, and, I'm, and, I'm, and, and I'm reluctant to say this, um, I feel there is, a, there is a humanity that has transcended our conversation. And particularly when you talked about white people, because I've seen the Portland, the Portland protests mm-hmm. and seen white moms for Black Lives Matters. And I'm thinking, wow, has the virus in some other way within the complexity and the tension invited us white moms to have a deconstruction of their definition of Black people? I'm using that language deliberately to the point where the narrative have shifted to say, oh my God, everybody needs to feel safe. Yes. Everyone and I am taking action. I am behaving from that new realization, Mm -hmm. right? Um, One of the things we've talked about this, that love is a verb. I say that all the time, right? Love isn't sitting under the boot, under the, under the tree in in a, in a lotus position. If you're loving sitting, sitting under the lotus tree in a lotus position, then you're just loving sitting. But the idea Scott Peck in the road less travel says, you know, Life is difficult and love is a verb, love is a behavior. And so when I see these white moms standing, I mean, mothers standing in front of white men in uniforms and weapons that can destroy them, daring them, daring them to do that and willing to die for it. To me, that is the act of one's humanity in real time, right? Eckhart Eckhart Tolle talks about being fully present. Yes. And when I see these white moms standing there, knowing the possibilities of what can happen with them and going out there night after night after night, the word being fully present really sits with me because the presence of mind it takes to leave your white, your white neighborhood go into danger for people whose society has informed you whose skin currency isn't equal to yours and say, oh, oh no, 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 thank you. I will not engage, I will not be complicit in a narrative of color or race hierarchy, but I will go out and fight and stand and die for my fellow man. Um, That's part of the the complexity and the tension is embedded in in all of that, isn't it? You're you're hearing me. And then when it is reduced to this as an appropriation of the Black Lives Matter movement, yes. Yes. (laughs) Okay. And what else is it? Okay, That's so yeah, and, and what else is it? Right. Okay, so can we also hold what else is it? Yeah, yeah, and you know, and what's next in this? And then how do we get to that place of holding that as well? Yeah. And that's all I'm asking us to do is to do what we've just done for the last hours to, you know, be in this conversation 
uh, talk about the, the complexity and then come to a place where then our action, our behaviors, our love, our compassion becomes informed by this kind of conversation, not the ease of narrative that is so familiar to us that we can do a recitation on it in a, in a moment. But then what I'm learning now is that where I was even an hour ago has shifted uh, and it holds much more. It holds the story of the Holocaust survivor that I did not hold. It holds choices that others are making like these mothers in, in Portland right now. And, and, and I hold them and see them as an extension of me and of my story. Uh, and that if I can find my intersection in that story, then I found my common humanity. Amazing grace. How sweet the sound. <laughs> um, Zach Green, I love you. I always learn from you. Whenever we are together, you bring something to the conversation that if you were there, would not occur. And for that, I thank you for being on the planet with me at this time, inviting me authentically to sit in the tension and to not bring my fear into the tension, but to sit in the tension holding the complexity and the nuance of all there, all there is. And for that, I thank you.